See you on the access channel, channel looking like a straight white guy. <laughs> you trying to get that? I told you, I'll switch it up. I'm fucking no, you really, you get that money, bro. You really fucked me up. Because I was watching with somebody. I'm like, cut it like DJ Ski Good. They said, that ain't Ski Good. That is good. Turn it up. <laughs> And we'll be back with more Access TV. Oh, yeah, we're Go ahead, nephew. I'm getting that marquee with money. Hey, pal. You know what I did like? Uh, that so so deaf shit. That was killer, right? Yeah, they killed it with that. Yeah, go ahead. That was dope as fuck. Do they killed it with that. Um, I want them to do Lion Fest, dude. Mm. That was dope as fuck. That shit was killer. I was mad Jay didn't call me. They killed it. I mean, they had everybody. Like, everybody. Even when they got... I'm, I'm, I'm mad I didn't get to call them. Like, you know I would have came out there and did that for you. Open. That shit would have been crazy. That crazy. shit was dope. Next time. Let's go, man. How you feeling? I'm good, dude. I can't All right, I'll get in a little bit. I don't want to take up too much of your time. No, you could never do that. You know, you get extra time. <laughs> Family. We'll you make guys ready? motherfuckers wait. Ski TV. We are right here with the lion, Snoop himself. What's good, sir? What up, Ski? So, um, it was interesting. I watched the documentary, and it wasn't what I expected. I thought it was just going to be about you going to Jamaica and, you know, recording an album. It ended up telling your whole life story and really going in deep into your feelings. Now, uh, first up, before we get into, into some of those conversations, what, uh, when did you first have the thoughts of wanting to make a reggae album? And you, you said you were tired of hip hop. When did you first have those thoughts of kind of stepping back for a moment? Well, I felt like it was a certain point in my career where it was nothing I could do in hip hop that could outdo what I've done. You know, I felt like I was the Michael Jordan of hip hop. I won six championships, three back to back, Took a couple years off, won three back to back, and I feel like I wanted to go play some baseball, or some golf, or something. You know what I'm saying? So, reggae was just, you know, calling me because I always wanted to sing, you know, and I didn't feel like I could do an R&B record, but I always felt like reggae was close to me because it was a spiritual move as well as a a mental and a physical move. So the spirit of Rastafari called me to profess this music and to put it out there and let the whole world know what reggae music is about. And it just pushed love and peace because I've always been pushing that, but my music never represented that. That's interesting because you said something in the documentary how you have these big records that live far beyond even your lifetime and stuff in hip hop, yet you don't have songs that you can go to the White House and perform. You don't have things like that. What was it like, you know, going into to this album and being able to make those types of music? Like, well, I want to get deeper into like No Guns Allowed and songs like that. But, uh, you know, how, how does that feel? Because now you can go and, you know, you don't have to worry about doing, you know, the PG-13 version. Mm -hmm. Like, you can do the real version. Now, now that's, that's, that's good you say that because I hate when I have to break down a version and make it TV friendly when it wasn't roped that way. Now I have songs that are written TV friendly and I'll be able to perform them the way that they were intentionally written. And to me, that's a great expression because I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to say that I love to live and I love to spread love and it's okay to be cool. It's okay not to do this and not to be a bad guy. So now my music will represent that. You definitely step out of your comfort zone, even with the topics and stuff. But was it uh, difficult making that jump? Were you nervous at all about how people would take it when you're you a gangster rapper from, from Long Beach going to Jamaica to do a reggae album with a white boy? Were you, were you scared of like, damn, like people are going to hate on me for this, especially because, you know, you've done so much over your career. Realistically, I felt like I was really Bob Marley reincarnated okay. because remember Bob Marley flew to London and got with Chris Blackwell, which was a white boy. And they made magic. And then, you know, I flew to Jamaica and met with Diplo, a white boy, and made magic. And then Chris Blackwell let us use his spot. That's where we were staying at when we made the record. And Chris showed up and gave us some deep conversation about how him and Bob got down and how it was all. And it just felt like he was telling me and Diplo's story right before our eyes. And it was just, the moment was so magic and it had no reason to feel unsure to worry about what critics or someone would say. Color has nothing to do with great musicians and great people who make great music. The guys that got out on this record, Ariel, uh, Drasco, those guys are white guys. And those guys are funky. I mean, funky. They was pulling up. We got it in us, man. We got monster, some of us. Monster, monster <laughs> funk, man. I didn't feel like, man, we got to let somebody else fix the track. I put all my trust in those guys. And at the end of the day, I feel like the record represents totally where I wanted to come from. Absolutely, and there was an interesting comparison you made. Talk about it a little bit from Long Beach and 213 to Trenchtown, how kind of there was these two epicenters in terms of music, like you, Warren, Nate, like all this at a time, and then at the same time, what, what happened with Trenchtown? What was it like kind of, you know, it being was, part it, of that and going it, to witness where It another? was so similar, Ski, to where I come from that I felt like walking around, 
I was walking in Long Beach. It's it crazy. felt just like that. And it's crazy the way they, they transparent the movie and made it look like from Trish down to Long Beach, but that's exactly what it felt like. The moment was that. All that talent in that area and people coming together to create it and make it and believe it and then taking it outside the area and the world loves it. That's what we did in Long Beach. Wow. We had to cook it at home first. But it was a lot of homegrown talent. But only the chosen few was able to rise above the rest and become 213. True. Now, um, the most interesting part of the documentary is how you really, you went into everything. Like, I thought I knew everything about Snoop Dogg, being, knowing you, being a hip-hop head. But you, you went into everything, even, you know, the Suge situation and everything with that. And I saw you guys t together the, for the first time in a long time on your, on your Instagram. So is, is that a case of things being solved, everything being good, or just kind of time healing all wounds? I think time heals all wounds. And then being a bigger man mm -hmm. and being one who accepts responsibility and right or wrong, I like saving lives and I don't like to take lives. And if that means putting my hand out saying I'm wrong, I apologize, can we be cool? I'll do that. As opposed to me going behind my back, pulling the gun out and getting somebody or me doing something vicious to you. Now in the movie you said Suge was the greatest West Coast business person <laughs> of all time. And he gave everybody what they wanted. Pac wanted to be a gangster, mafia life. He gave it to him. What did Suge give you at the time that, you know, what did you want that Suge gave you? He gave me a voice. He gave me a voice to speak. And I was like E.F. Hutton. When Snoop talk, everybody listens. Now, was it tough going into all these other situations in your life, such as the time when, you know, you were, you were big into pimping, and then you even got into, you know, I was surprised you talked about, you know, some of the, the criminal things that you had with the gun case and specifically seeing, you know, I, I was telling them off camera how, you know, the song No Guns Allowed with Corey, how the, the story behind that is so passionate. Like, I love that record a thousand times more after, after seeing that. What was it like opening up to a level like that? Because I've never, I didn't know all that stuff. And I'm a Snoop fan. I'm, I know everything about hip hop. I know everything about West Coast hip hop. And I still didn't know all the situations around that. But, you know, what was it like opening up? Well, it was hard, but the director and myself, uh, I call him Lil Head. <laughs> I like fucking <laughs> with Lil Head. But he, he really worked me. Like, he directed his ass off. He pushed me, he challenged me, he, he told me, man, I mean, you know, we need to leave it on the screen. And that was actually the last part of the movie that we shot. The movie was done, and he was like, we need to shoot one more day. And I'm like, why? He like, because there's some things that's missing. I need to get you to give me something that's missing. I need you to open up. It's just going to be me and you. and ain't going to be no whole lot of people. So it was just me and him. And the questions that he was asking me, you know, you didn't get a chance to hear him. You just heard my answers. But it was great setup questions. It was an alley-oop. It's crazy. Now, working with, with Corey B, especially, let's talk about the record No Guns Allowed, which is the next single. Uh, you added Drake to it and stuff uh, first. What's it like working with, A, your, your daughter, first up, on, on a record? She sounds amazing on there. That's my Thank favorite you. record, I think, on there. Thank you. Man, working with Corey B is awesome, man, because I remember when she was horrible, when she couldn't sing, and I was her worst fan, because I tell her, look, this shit is garbage. You're going to have to fix this. Look, you're not going to be my daughter singing like, no. So you were never, you never lied to her, like, no. oh, you sound like Mariah Carey. You didn't see on Fatherhood when she <laughs> thought she was going to sing the national anthem? Uh -huh. If you don't get that bullshit out of here, no. Oh, say no, we, no, no. So you're probably tougher on her than you would be somebody else. Yeah, then. but what I love about her is that she went and got vocal coaching. She went and got training. She went and got good. She dedicated herself. She, she made herself great. It was there, but she made herself great to where bringing her to the studio was awesome because now I see the growth in her and I see how she right in pocket and she hit that note and it was in my head before she said it. So when she spit it, it was like, oh, wow. And now you could just see her like this now. I say by the time she's 16 and 17, she's going to be writing her own songs and she's going to be writing from a great place. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, what made you guys want to put Drake on that record? Because it's such a personal record between you guys with, with the backstory behind it. Now, what uh, made you want to go ahead and add, you know, well, I, I knew about that certain shooting incident in Toronto, mm -hmm. and I always loved Drake. You know, I know I love him for his writing and how he get out and how he can deliver. You know, he delivers great party records, but I wanted him to say something on this record, and I feel like he could really say something and address some things that need to be said and take the party out of it for a minute, because we both know him for making party records. You think of Drake and Snoop, oh, this is going to be a party jam. Yeah. But it's like, nah. 
No guns allowed. This is how you keep the party rocking all night. Leave the guns out. Now for the people that just look at the title, don't look at the backstory, that are gonna, they're going to criticize you for that because they're going to say, what is he talking about? He's, he's rapped about guns and stuff his whole life. What's your message to them? Guns kill. Um, guns are, are good and bad. Good when they're in the right hands, bad when they're in the wrong hands. And when they're in the wrong hands, too many innocent people suffer. And too many kids and too many people whose lives are cut short for no reason. And to me, when I go to countries like Amsterdam, where I ain't never seen nobody with a gun, not even the police officers, and I very seldom hear about vicious crimes over there involving guns or murder. So I'm just one that's real, man. I grew up in a society where guns were necessary. It was better to be caught with one than without one. Now, um, you're, you're on a whole different vibe and stuff, this whole album. Are you, you see yourself going back to hip-hop and coming with that? What's, and just in general, what's your thoughts on where hip-hop is right now as a culture? I think hip-hop is the biggest form of music in the whole wide world. And uh, one thing about hip-hop, you just got to stay true to it, and it's going to stay true to you. That's why I chose to jump into reggae, because I felt like I'm not hip-hop right this moment, you know? I'm fully into this reggae, into this saying something right now. And I couldn't say it from my hip hop perspective because my hip hop perspective is gangster. Yeah. And I can't change that. It's like Al Pacino. You know, we love him in these movies that he played these nice characters where he's all a nice guy, but I sure loved him as Tony Montana. I sure loved him as, you understand me, as Carlito. You understand right. me? Like, I love Snoop Dogg when he snooped out. <laughs> now, um, you seem happier than you've ever been. Is that true? I am, man, because I got understanding at my house now, and um, I never really had that with my wife and my kids. It was usually um, my music career and then them. Now it's them and my music career. Now, last question. I feel like um, a lot of people are, it's almost, you have an advantage being Snoop because you're the worldwide icon, but I also feel like it might put you at a disadvantage where people aren't going to take you seriously kind of going into this album. Like, oh, Snoop's done a lot. He's just doing this. It's a phase and stuff. Last words, what would you say to them on why they should check out both the album and the documentary, Reincarnated? Well, one thing's for certain and two things for sure. Snoop Dogg don't never play with it. He always come with that real deal. And uh, this is a part of my life and this is a journey. And, you know, those who've been with me on my journey, the journey wouldn't be complete if you didn't get this record or this movie or go see this movie or enjoy it. Because it, it, it completes, you know, the chapter that you all been waiting for. You know, where does he go next? What's next for Snoop? He's been doing it for 20 years. What could he do next? And this is what I'm doing next. So check it out so you can find out how it happened, why it happened, and uh, roll with it. Lion Fest next week, South by Southwest, in theaters March 15th, and the album out in April. Yes, sir. Snoop Lion, thank you for sitting down with us, taking the time out in the studio. Bless up. <laughs> Rastafari. Yes, yeah, sir. I need a name next. You got to come up with something. Yeah, I'm going to bring you something fly. You know I got your love, one. My brother, always a pleasure, man. Oh, man.